Hi, good morning and good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Anya Gibhart. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, ECPAF's mission is to end HIV and AIDS in children, youth, and families. And obviously, um, we can't do this without a very important focus on TB. Um, at the same time, we also all know that we had to adjust our way of living and working uh, during the COVID pandemic. And so we are very happy to have this session um, where we're trying to uh, demonstrate to you the integrated service delivery for TB, HIV in the context of COVID. Um, as ECPAF, we have activities in over 17 countries and you will hear some examples from Kenya DRC. And we're also really uh, very pleased to be joined by our partners, Stop TB, and their contributions to this webinar. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you will hear um, some examples from Kenya, DRC. Um, we will hear from our uh, partners and colleagues from uh, uh, Stop TV. And then we will have a moderated discussion um, at the end of the session. Next slide. Um, however, during the presentations, please feel free to already start asking your questions through, through the Q&A box. Um, don't wait, you don't have to wait till the end of uh, all the presentations. Um, and also, if you have any connectivity issues, you can write in the chat box or you can email at the email address that's there. And then without any further ado, because we have a, a full program, I would like to hand over to Judith. And I hope you will enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, and welcome everyone. I will start off this conversation by talking about EGPAF's effort on integrating TB in HIV and COVID with the main aim of ensuring that our patients are receiving comprehensive care. Next slide, please. Now, based on the recent global TB report, it has been documented that there has been sharp drops in TB case notification in several high burden countries in the last year. And the modeling and analysis of this data of the impact of COVID-19 has shown that a drop of 50% in the detection of TB cases over a period of three months would lead to more than 400,000 TB deaths. And this, this, this report also highlights that there is evidence that people living with HIV and people with active TB are both at risk of high, at higher risk of COVID related morbidity and mortality. And at EGPAF, we've also seen this disruption of health services and have implemented efforts to mitigate these effects, focusing on turning the trajectory of case finding and notification, but also ensuring integrated comprehensive TB, COVID and HIV care. And when you think about the disruption, it's both at the TB clearance level because of poor access and other factors such as fear and, and lockdowns, but also effects on the TB service providers, either due to lack of equipment, the restrictions as well, and also lack of, lack of, uh, of commodities. Next slide, please. And, and, and so to start off, I want to highlight some of the effects that as EGPAF we have noted, and some have already alluded to in the introduction slide, but some of, the, some of them included um, reassigning of TB staff and equipment. And in some cases, they even reassigned the TB wards to be COVID wards. There was a reduction and longer spaces of clinical visits for the TB patients. In some countries, there was the use of the gene expert platform for COVID-19, and this crowded out TB, TB diagnosis. Many of our countries had delay in supply for TB supplies and consumables, including the gene expert cartridges, and also limited availability of PPE for the community lay workers and other lay work and other healthcare workers in facilities as, as well. And I think the other element was that the DST results was not received in time due to various, various issues. And so it made treatment monitoring very difficult. Next slide, please. So in terms of summary of what as EGPAF we did uh, to mitigate this effort, we had a lot of interventions. And the first one was uh, early in the pand pandemic, 
we jointly developed a TB COVID technical guidance that focused on how our country programs could ensure TB service delivery is not interrupted while also implementing the IPC measures. And this guidance included a summary of points of synergy between the two diseases. You know, we talked about how to implement an integrated TB and COVID screening tool. And we shall be seeing later an example from Malawi, but also how to safely integrate community services for either TB contact tracing, screening, and also refills. And we'll see an example in, in, in one of our countries as well. We also facilitated MMD refill of TB drugs and also TPT, but also ART. Next slide, please. And so the next slide is a summary, and this is a busy slide. I will not walk us through all the rows, but this really summarizes what for us were the key impact of COVID on our TB work and the mitigation measures. So for instance, when we had disruption of service delivery, the team embarked on collecting and tracking the service availability while also you know, integrating the mitigation efforts. We had support to ensure continuity of service provision through the refills of multi-month, and we also had you know, the, 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 the tele, tele counseling for clients who are enrolled in the program to ensure that they would adhere to treatment. Next slide, please. So the next table still summarizes some of the mitigation measures. Um, so the, the, the other element, you know, and, and, and remember at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, a lot of health workers were also apprehensive and they had the fear of, of, of COVID. And in some of the countries we procured and distributed PPEs, not just for the facility health workers, but for community workers as well, to enable them to do the community contact tracing. And we also instigated a lot of virtual support, either remote support to our sites through telephone and WhatsApp, or virtual training, and, and today we have this meeting using Zoom. So these were also instituted in many of our, of our countries to mitigate the, the, the impact of COVID. Next slide, please. Now, I want to look at some, some of the data, and the data you see on this slide is data from our PEPFA-funded projects that is collected in our day team. And this first slide looks at the impact of COVID-19 on the number of TB clients tested. So this is the number and not a, 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 a proportion. And the reference quarter that you see at the beginning is the January to March. So we are using that as a reference quarter to measure the impact of the numbers tested. And you can see in many of the countries showed by the curve above, there was a dip uh, at, at the beginning of the pandemic and many of the countries recovered. So in a country like Tanzania, they had a dip with recovery, but the second dip you see in Tanzania was mainly because of lack of gene expert cartridges. And so the number tested for HIV reduced because the number diagnosed for HIV, for TB also reduced. In, in a country like Cameroon, there seems to be an upward trajectory despite a slight initial reduction. And this is because early on in the, in the pandemic, Cameroon adapted the community approaches and they were able to support TB diagnosis and hence uh, TB testing of, of HIV of TB clients. Next slide, please. The, the next slide is also showing our PEPFA data. And this looks at the number of TB HIV co-infected clients initiated on ART. And so as expected, as the number of TB patients tested for HIV reduced, then the numbers co-infected also reduced. And so the number initiated on ART also reduced. But I think of note is that the uptake of HIV testing remained high, almost at 99%. And the uptake of ART among the, those identified also remained high. So the offering of services that, to clients that were identified were basically maintained at these sites. Next slide, please. This next slide looks at our TPT uh, services, and this is TB prevention services. And the data here, this again is from our PEPFA funded projects. And this indicator is reported biannually. So we only have the three biannual periods. This is percentage of ART clients who are started on a standard course of TB prevention therapy and completed it. So again, you can see in some of the countries towards the right, this completion was maintained, but in some of the countries towards the left, this was not really, it's, it's, it's a mixed picture. And I think this is a historical issue around data, data, data collection, documentation of TB, TPT outcome and the introduction of the TPT registers. So again, this is something that is being monitored and, and some of the countries that have good data have had a focal person for TPT, but also 
know many of these countries have an EMR where they can track those who've completed CPT, and they also share where they distribute the TP, TPT, either in the pharmacy or in the HIV clinic. So again, a lot of successes and challenges around this, this, this data beyond just the COVID impact. Next slide, please. Now, the next two slides are going to focus on our unitaid funded CAP-TB project. And this is a project whose population, the population we focus on in this project is the children who are zero to 14 years, either HIV positive, negative, or unknown. And we implement this, this project in nine countries. So if you can look at this, the set of, of, of diagrams above, on the left are the numbers screened. So if you look at the numbers screened, and these are children zero to 14 years, the numbers screened had a dip during April to June when COVID really hit our African countries. And there was some recovery towards, uh, towards the later part of the year. And this was matched with the number that were, were diagnosed. So the dip we see is, is, is matched with the, with the number that were diagnosed. And I think the screening reduced basically because there was fear of clients, like we mentioned, to come to the facility. There were challenges around initiating services, but these were recovered. The set of graphs you see below talk about, and this is still in our unitaid funded CAP TB, talks about treatment initiation on the left and treatment completion. So if you look at the treatment initiation, despite the reduced number and the, the, brown, the brown bar is the reduced number of those who are diagnosed, uptake of air of, of, of TB treatment was maintained. So you can see the, the percentage is almost at 100%. That was maintained because services were available in the facility. And if you look at the right, it looks at the blue, the gray bar is initiated on TB treatment and the orange is successfully completing, completing the treatment. You can see at the beginning, those who are completing uh, at the beginning, uh, January to March had a good completion rate. But the, if you go towards April to June and July to September, these are clients who are started on TB around the period when the COVID hit. And so we are seeing a challenge in terms of, of uptake. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because some of these children were initiated on multi-month dispensation. For example, for, for children, they were being put on one month instead of two weeks. And for some children, it was two months. And so this, this may have disrupted uh, the, the treatment and so calls for proper monitoring, even with the multi-month dispensation of the, of the TB treatment. Next slide, please. The next slide also looks at the, the CAP TB program, looking at, at TPT therapy cascade. And as, as you can see, the, the completion again is going, is, is going lower, similar to what we've explained before, issues around multi-month dispensation and perhaps you know, poor monitoring of those who are initiated on multi-month. So generally from this CAP TB data, the clients dropped during the initial months there was recovery of the numbers, you know, and, uh, and, and the services were maintained at facility. Next slide, please. I want to talk about the integration of screening for TB and COVID with an example of Malawi. And the picture on the left shows the initial screening. So Malawi initiated this in July, 2020. So initially the patients were screened by a, by a lay cadre. They screened everyone who came to the facility and these services were, were initiated at different entry points. And so for the ones who are found to be suspect for TB or COVID, they had a second part of integrated screening led by the clinician, as you can see that on the right, and then the clinician will send them for sample collection. Next slide, please. So this integrated screening of TB and COVID was also included also developing an integrated COVID-19 and TB register. So combining the COVID and TB, yes, no, yes, no questions. They had an integrated COVID and TB specimen collection and testing register to track the contacts as well and those who have, whose samples have been collected. And they also developed an integrated COVID-TB dashboard. Next slide, please. And so from our Malawi example, just to showcase some of the data they collected, on the next slide. And as you can see on the left, if you look at the numbers screened for COVID and TB were the same. So they screened patients for both COVID and TB. They identified the COVID suspects and TB presumptive patients. 66% of the COVID suspects were, had their samples collected and 85% of the presumptive TB had samples collected. And again, uh, COVID positive was at a rate of 18%. So one of the challenges they had in this site is that not all sites could collect and test the, 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 the COVID-19 samples. But I think the lessons from here is that 
for anyone with, with respiratory symptoms, it's important to test them for both TB and COVID. Next slide, please. As I come towards the, the, the end of the, of the presentation, the other thing we are monitoring as EGPAF is to ensure we have interventions for the recovery period. And some of the interventions, apart from adhering to the MOH uh, set, set rules, is to ensure our programs are looking for those, the treatment interrupters, bringing them back on treatment, ensuring the supply and access to TB medicines uh, in the facilities, but also documenting lessons and TB outcomes during the pandemic. And so in my last slide that has the summary and recommendations based on our experience, uh, next slide, please. I think countries and programs have seen the effects of COVID. The COVID effects are widespread. Recovery rates differ as the pandemic waves come at different times. And as an example, if you look at Uganda, they are now descending from the third wave. But if you look at Kenya, we are at the foothills of the fourth wave. And so the recovery rates and times are going to be different as we have different waves of the pandemic. Service delivery was by and large maintained uh, despite reduced clinic attendees. Data on changes in TB treatment outcomes among people living with HIV and TB is important, needs to be quantified. And, uh, and the other element to, to focus on is the supply chain management needs to be improved beyond the issues brought about by, by COVID. That is my last slide. Thank you very much. Allow me to introduce now Sila Lelei. Sila is a TB treat technical officer based in Egpaf, Kenya in our Turkana province. Welcome, Sila. Thank you, Dr. Judith, for introduction. I'm going to take you through the Tufkana experience as far as TB diagnosis, treatment, adherence is concerned. Uh, ECPAF CAP TB projects work in Tufkana County, which is hard to reach a county. Next slide. Tukana County Port has three countries, that's Uganda, Sudan, and Ethiopia with a land mass of 77,000 kilometers square. Temperatures are a bit high between 33 to 39 uh, with a population of 1.2 million people. Uh, we have a refugee camp, which are hosted a number of nationalities with a total population of 160,000. Uh, majority of the population in Tukana are nomadic, uh, population, so they tend to move with the uh, livestock depending on availability of uh, uh, pastures. The, the county still has uh, challenges in terms of a uh, poor road network, electricity, and uh, mobile coverage. And also facilities are uh, distant from each other. Thus, clients need to travel uh, a huge distance. As we can see from the picture, that's the kind of housing that uh, people in Tuscan are using. It's called a TB Manata. Next slide. In terms of challenges that we are facing in Tuscan County, they are classified into three. We have systemic issues, and here we are talking of uh, the kind of structure, the TB Manata, and uh, we are experiencing challenges because a number of clients need to travel a distance of over 150 kilometers to be uh, contained in a TB manata for them to take the TB treatment. And this particularly is on drug sensitive, drug resistant uh, TB. There is limited integration of TB services in all uh, child entry points. And as a county has mentioned, uh, we have few facilities. Uh, that are diagnostic, uh, 67 facilities are offering uh, TB services with 34 being diagnostic and only four gene expert uh, machines across the county. Uh, community factors, we still have a challenge in referral and uh, linkages from the community and uh, the kind of structures, the arts don't, they are poorly ventilated and low awareness of TB among the community. On individual factors, as mentioned, the nomadic lifestyle, so the priorities tend to change, and uh, there's still a stigma associated with the TB disease. They think uh, if you have a TB disease, you also have 
HIV disease. Next slide. CAPTV project implemented the intervention model as from April 2019 to December 2020. And uh, actually, these models are facility based and, and under facility based, we train uh, a huge number of healthcare care workers, that's 140, on TB management and also engage a cough monitors, 24 who actually support the TB screening in all uh, entry points. Uh, Community-based intervention, uh, we work with the facility to identify the community health volunteers, who work with the GUs, that's the uh, community health extension uh, workers, in coordinating the contact tracing activities and also creation of uh, awareness at the community level. On diagnosis cascade, uh, the project managed to have uh, supported the Lord Wakan Referral Hospital with an additional gene expert machine and strengthened the sputum sample networking through engaging additional uh, motor, motorbike rider who normally picks specimen for gene expert testing. Uh, at the Lord Wakan Referral Hospital, uh, we set up a teleradiology for interpretation of a chest X-ray whereby a difficult chest X-ray is being sent for review by radiology and results transmitted within two hours. TB treatment monitoring, uh, the project managed to have actually piloted the 3RH across the CAP TB supported site, supported the psychosocial support group, and also worked with other partners in ensuring that the nutrition uh, commodities are supplied since this is a region that's a semi arid uh, county. Next slide. In terms of provision of standard operating procedures and tools, the project managed to have actually supplied facilities with the screening tools, uh, uh, SOPs, uh, dosing charts, and actually data capacity building of uh, cough monitors and the uh, community health volunteers who actually have been supporting in the, the shifting screening for TB and the TPT enrollment. Next slide. This table illustrates the results from the three pilot sites in Trukana. Uh, baseline was conducted in August 2017 to July 2018. As we can see, there was an improvement across the indicators. Uh, on average per month, initially we couldn't get the number screen, but through the use of a CAP TB screening tools, we had a screening uh, of uh, 2,659 children on average per month. Access to gene expert uh, is a huge improvement to 433%, and TB case notification, we had an improvement of 15% uh, per month, and uh, track sensitive TB treatment at 3%, and uh, treatment success improved by 51%. So we are seeing that despite, despite being hard to reach in place, we managed to have actually done some work. Next slide. This table shows us the screening cascade across uh, the period, and we are seeing there was an improvement from 80% uh, to 95% over the period. And our target population here is uh, less than 15 years. Next. TPT initiation, uh, after CAP TB interventions, training of healthy care workers, we are seeing there was an improvement from 49% to 89% during the intervention period. Next. The key lessons that we have learned from the project is that the use of cough monitors and lay healthy care workers 
support in TB screening in all child entry point and also child contact management uh, is a source for TB enrollment and uh, and uh, there is a prompt linkage to TB diagnostic work. Home visit by CHVs, uh, uh, community health volunteers and TPD provision is feasible and increasing uptake for TB services. The use of uh, clinical diagnosis through the transmission of a chest X-ray has led to improvement in pediatric TB case identification. Uh, Facility-based training for healthcare workers is feasible since it's cheap and uh, a huge number of healthcare workers are being uh, trained. Uh, alternative sample collection, that's a gastric aspiration and gene expert testing is also being done very well. Uh, sample networking uh, by use of uh, motorbike riders has seen an increase in gene expert uptake and increase in pediatric case identification. Yeah, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so Sheila. <laughs> um, thank you, Sila, and, and good morning and afternoon to all the attendees. Uh, my name is uh, Jackie Hub, and I'm with the Sopti Partnership here in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, next slide, please. Before I dive into the heart of our reimagining TB care initiative, I want to quickly provide some context about some of the challenges that the SAPTU partnership and particularly our team um, is trying to solve. What COVID-19 has shown us is that current health systems, um, particularly in TB affected countries, but to be honest, um, around the world, um, are still um, one fragmented, um, meaning we seem to be only able to fight one disease at a time. Two, inequitable, meaning not all communities and people, particularly the most marginalized, have access to care. Uh, three, outdated, meaning we're still using legacy approaches, solutions, systems, and four, unsustainable, meaning we're unable to meet the real time evolving needs of the population. Next slide, please. The Stop Tea Partnership, um, for those who may not already be aware, um, has really been um, at the forefront of evaluating and rolling out digital health technologies, um, such as computer-aided detection for chest x-rays, digital adherence technologies, et cetera, for TB for close to seven years. So for example, um, one of our teams, TB Reach, has been evaluating these CAD solutions um, starting seven years ago, and um, they were recently reviewed and provided guidance on by WHO um, earlier this year. Um, and so as part of this portfolio of work, our team co-developed and rolled out the Reimagine TV Care Initiative, um, which, is, which is to modernize health systems in TV affected countries by transforming when, where, and how affordable quality and people-centered care is provided and access by leveraging digital health technologies for TV, COVID-19 and TB comorbidities such as HIV. Essentially, what we're trying to do um, here with this initiative is to catalyze more community and home-based care, bring care as close as possible to where the people are, their homes, their place of work, their place of congregation, et cetera. Um, and to, to digitalize or really to catalyze the digitalization of real-time data for TB and across diseases. So as you can see um, on this slide, there are three main pillars to the initiative. 
which includes identifying, sourcing, and assessing promising digital health technologies, accelerating the rollout of these promising digital health technologies, and then catalyzing and demonstrating an open source centralized ICT platform where all these um, promising digital health technologies and other applicable solutions for TB and cross diseases connects into. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to dive into every detail of each pillar and I apologize that some of these um, slides are very wordy and less infographic-esque. Um, but maybe what I'll do while you're taking a look at some of these slides is to just provide some key highlights. So regarding pillar one, one of the key activities will be to work hand in hand with um, our in-country partners, including country programs, implementing partners, and civil society and communities to have them identify challenges and opportunities in the care model um, that can be addressed by digital health technologies for TB and across diseases. Um, you know, after all this time and everything we've gone through, particularly in the last year and a half, um, there still is this propensity um, for countries from the global north and, you know, to be frankly honest with you, people from Geneva to think we sometimes know more what TB affected countries, community people need, and we radically need to move away from that type of mindset and thinking. Um, the other key activity I'd like to highlight is that we're also trying to actively source digital health technologies developed by innovators from TB affected countries who clearly have a better understanding of the challenges faced by TB affected communities and people. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding um, pillar two, as you can see from this slide, what we've done based on our previous um, experiences rolling out various solutions is to map out the critical pathway and stages. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to really accelerate the introduction and scale up of promising digital health technologies for TB and across diseases within a three to five year time frame once they've entered um, the commercialization stage. Next slide, please. And what this slide shows you, and it's a very high level um, uh, uh, picture, um, but we were trying to map out all the critical pathways and stages um, and really try to create um, this structured product launch ecosystem to shorten um, the time to market for some of these promising digital technologies. And, and what we're trying to do here is, um, as you can see, some of the stages um, will actually run in parallel. Um, from one another, or once they've completed, what happens is the next stage or the next set of activities, the next set of partners and stakeholders would be triggered. So we're hoping this kind of structured product launch ecosystem and support will actually accelerate how quickly some of these promising digital technologies will get to market. Next slide, please. What this slide shows um, are some illustrative activities um, for each critical pathway stage from advocacy and demand generation to scale up and sustainability. And within each activity, um, it's not shown here, but what we've done is map out who the critical partners and stakeholders are to implement some of these activities. The other thing um, I might want to highlight on this slide is the last box called financing. One thing we've noticed, particularly for innovators and innovations coming from the TV affected countries, is that they actually need additional capital um, to further um, commercialize their solution. And so what we're trying to do is actually partner um, with private entities, whether it be a private equity firm or an impact investment fund, who can potentially provide that kind of 
um, fit for purpose capital that some of these um, in-country innovators need. Next slide, please. So now we've you know, introduced, let's say in the perfect world, we've introduced and scaled up these promising digital technologies. What we want to try to do is ensure that they connect into an open source, centralized ICT platform um, to automate and standardize real-time data collection sharing to support improved decision-making. And hopefully um, this will also allow um, healthcare providers, um, community health workers, et cetera, to provide more quality people-centered care. Next slide, please. And what this slide shows is current um, solutions we've connected into an open source centralized ICT platform across the care model. And clearly there are still gaps that we need to fill. And so what we're trying to do is find innovators and innovations across the care model that we can continue to plug into this ICT platform. And as you can see, many of these solutions have multi-disease applicability for TB, COVID-19, and TB comorbidities such as HIV. Next slide, please. What this slide show, and this is my last slide actually, um, is our future demonstration study um, of an open source centralized ICT platform in Mumbai. But what I want to um, note here very importantly is that for this study, we're not trying to recreate the Nickshape platform, um, which many of you might be aware of. Um, what we're simply trying to do is support the enhancement and the expansion of the current Nickshape platform, particularly Mumbai, to further connect more solutions into that platform and to make it more integrated and interoperable. And the reason why we're doing this study is we've had um, some TB affected countries and country programs coming to us wanting to replicate um, a Nixay like platform in their country. And we want to be able to develop the appropriate protocols, develop the appropriate implementation documents, et cetera, to be able to replicate this kind of open source centralized ICT platform in other TB affected countries. So I think with that said, um, I'd like to now give my floor to, I'm not quite sure if Evelyn um, from Sapi Partnership Kenya is, um, was able to join us. Otherwise, um, do I give the floor to Mac Maxine from DRC? Alex, um, let me know um, who should take over from here. But Evelyn is on, yes. Evelyn, please okay. go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm going to take us through the role of, the role of civil society here, give us a TB champions in demanding creation for TB services. Next. Next slide, please. TB in children is still a huge problem. And um, yeah, according to the recent survey done about um, quite a number of children, 22,000 children have not been reached with, it, with TB facility services. Before I take us through the presentation, allow me to give you a, a brief story of this girl, this young girl, I'll call her Leah. Leah was diagnosed with TB in November last year. And unfortunately, the father, who was a sole breadwinner, lost his job due to COVID. And by the time we visited the family, the landlord was about to close the house because they had not paid rent for three months. They were forced to relocate to a county that is about 300 kilometers out away from Nairobi, a county called Bugoma. We followed up to ensure that uh, the, the young girl, allow me to call her Leah, got the services and that um, she continued with her treatment. And what we did, we followed with the mother and came to know where she had relocated to and linked her up with a TB champion, the lady in blue, her name is Dorothy. And what we found out was that in that facility where she was supposed to be getting her, her, first, her treatment, they didn't have pediatric formulation. And Dorothy, as a TB champion, had to follow up with the facility to ensure that there was she got a pediatric formulation, though for a few days they had to crush the adult tablets. Le um, Dorothy followed up with the treatment. She followed up with the, with the mother and the girl. 
until she completed her treatment. As we talk, Leah got her last dose of TB treatment in May, and she's completely cured of TB. Role of communities in demand creation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. At the country level, we have different, the um, communities are represented in different structures or different uh, policy making processes. And that is, um, that is where they start their advocacy for demand creation. As such, they're represented in di different working groups and uh, technical working groups. The Kenya Coordinating Mechanism for Global Fund, all the national TB policy making processes, the national strategic plan, all those processes, we ensure that there's a TB champion who is represented so that they can make the demands or they can advocate for whatever it is for children from that point. Okay, they also engage in activities like uh, profiling of TB and HIV and COVID among the communities. They're involved in creating awareness. They do, uh, they, they support the patients um, as they take the treatment, for example, in the case of Leah. They do demand creation. They advocate for human rights for patients. And of course, they do resource, uh, advocacy for resource mobilization for TB and specifically pediatric TB at the county levels. Next. Next slide. Okay. Some of the successes that have been, that we have realized through community engagement is one, adoption and implementation of the, and the rollout of the TPT at the country level through a lot of advocacy. Uh, TPT has been adopted and guidelines have been developed. And um, we are currently working with the TB champions to ensure that the implementation of that policy is, is fully implemented and that there's also adequate funding from the domestic resources for TPT. Um, they have also been doing a lot of advocacy to TB, to TB and HIV services amid COVID-19. And one success that uh, we have experienced is that one of our TB champions was actually honored by PEPFA for his role in ensuring that the TB patients continued accessing their services even with the COVID restrictions and also the stigma that, that, that came up because of COVID. He went, he was engaged in community activities, uh, providing a drink counseling for TB services. Adoption of COVID, COVID services and commodities, we, we engage the communities in doing, it should be communities and civil society, in doing advocacy for the rapid tests for COVID when the country, when we realized the country was a bit, uh, was lagging behind in adopting the COVID test. And what we did was uh, writing a letter to the president and uh, asking him to speed up the adoption of the COVID rapid test. Advocacy for commitment for TB resources. We have been engaging them again for advocacy from the political leaders, both at the country level and the county levels, to ensure that there's allocation, adequate allocation, for TB both at, uh, at both levels and advocacy for sustained pediatric commodities. What the communities do at the community level <clears throat> is being vigilant to ensure that there's constant supply of commodities. And whenever they detect a stock out, we have the systems which they use to report to us or we, the, the, we also plan how we are going to advocate for the, for the replenishment of the stock out. Next. Next slide, please. What have been the challenges that we have? Sorry, back. That the challenges, one of the major challenges is success with COVID. Of course, we have all shifted our approach to technology, but we have challenges in the communities accessing the technology to enable them to engage in interventions and even advocacy. Economic constraints, you understand, for example, for you to participate in a Zoom meeting, you need a smartphone, you need the bundles. Um, 
inadequate capacity for TB response among communities. Of course, there's, need a lot, there's a lot of need for capacity building for communities to be able to engage at the community level and also for advocacy. And we also realize we don't have budget lines for community engagement for TB or if they're there, they are quite, they are quite limited. And um, yeah, we also lack support to reach out to patients whenever we want the communities to follow up with patients at the community level. And the recommendations are there. We, we would want to see more support to the communities, for example, to access technology, to ensure there's adequate capacity building for them to be able to do what they are supposed to do. And uh, the data, we, the, for them to do advocacy, for example, on pediatrics at the county level, we need ready data when we need it for advocacy. And um, like I mentioned, we also need sustained funding for the communities to be able to, to be able to do the community activities for pediatric TB. Next. And next slide. Oh. That should be the last slide. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eveline. And now we'll be handing it over to Maxine Lunga, Secretary National. Um, they... Please go ahead, Maxine. Merci, Sarah. Merci pour le micro. Donc, uh... Je vais vous faire euh, la présentation sur notre expérience ici à Kinshasa dans le cadre des activités communautaires euh, pour le projet euh, CAPTB. Euh, next slide, please. Voilà, donc euh, dans le cadre de nos, nos interventions, euh, euh, nous avons d'abord euh, des grandes interventions euh, euh, communautaires. La première, c'est l'intégration du screening de la tuberculose dans les portes autres que la tuberculose, dans les centres de santé, euh, donc CITCAP TB. Et c'est là, à travers euh, la sensibilisation qu'on qu réalise dans les services de nutrition, euh, services de consultation post-natale, prénatale, aussi euh, de la maternité pour euh, chercher euh, les enfants qui, euh, qui sont évidemment amenés au centre de santé par leurs parents qui pouvaient avoir euh, la présomption de la tuberculose pour les orienter vers le service de la tuberculose. Et ça se passe très bien là. Deuxième intervention, c'est dans le cadre de l'investigation systématique des personnes en contact avec les malades de la tuberculose mis sous traitement dans les structures de, dans les centres de santé, euh, donc site CAP-TB. Et c'est là dans les ménages euh, pour, premièrement, euh, orienter euh, toute personne présumée de la tuberculose vers les centres de santé pour les diagnostics et les traitements de la tuberculose en cas de diagnostic positif, mais aussi pour les enfants de, de 0 à 5 ans pour les traitements préventifs en cas de non-symptômes euh, de la tuberculose. Et alors, la mise en œuvre de ces activités euh, se porte très bien, mais nous avons euh, documenté beaucoup d'obstacles, de, 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 surtout par rapport aux parents, au niveau des ménages, pour amener leurs enfants euh, contact dans les structures de prise en charge. D'abord parce que les traitements étaient très longs, des six mois, donc traitement euh, de prévention de la tuberculose de six mois mais aussi par rapport à la santé des enfants qui ne présentaient aucun symptôme de la tuberculose et aussi la distance qui les séparait donc de, de ménages, des domiciles des, des parents vers les centres de santé. Donc, cela nous a poussé à initier une troisième intervention, donc faire hausser notre voix communautaire, parce que le Club des Amis d'Amiens, c'est une organisation des de ex-patients de la tuberculose. Donc, nous avons initié les plaidoyers en faveur de la tuberculose pédiatrique auprès d'abord des responsables de structures sanitaires euh, pour permettre à ce que les parents qui viendront avec les enfants pour les traitements préventifs soient directement euh, euh, reçus et que les, les enfants soient directement mis sous euh, traitement préventif sans 
euh, problème. Donc, nous avons développé à ce point-là trois activités. D'abord, il fallait développer les matériaux de messages clés pour euh, persuader les responsables des structures et puis approcher ces responsables des structures en session de dialogue de plaidoyer pour qu'ils puissent arriver à comprendre les besoins et réduire euh, ou supprimer les obstacles. Et mais à la fin, organiser donc une, euh, une consultation multipartite avec les partenaires de, de mise en œuvre, les programmes nationaux de lutte contre la tuberculose et ses responsables des structures, une première dans notre pays, et ça donnait des bons fruits. Next slide, please. Next slide. Donc, euh, les principaux défis que nous avons documentés et qui entravent l'accès aux soins de la tuberculose, pour, surtout pour les enfants, c'était que quelques parents n'acceptent pas facilement euh, les traitements préventifs. J'en ai évoqué euh, quelques raisons. Et donc là, il faut se dire qu'après euh, la clôture du projet euh, CAPTB, nous pensons qu'il va falloir réfléchir comment maintenir cet élan pour que les parents puissent continuer à amener les enfants euh, au niveau de, des structures pour ces traitements préventifs parce que c'est un blocage qui peut continuer après le projet CAPTB. Il y a aussi au niveau des structures l'exigence des frais de consultation qui est une vraie barrière pour la mise en sous traitement préventif des enfants contact de moins de 5 ans, très important. Mais nous avons aussi connu quelques ruptures intempestives de stock de médicaments de la tuberculose pédiatrique, ce qui décourageait les parents qui amenaient les enfants parce qu'ils se disaient on a amené les enfants pour le traitement préventif, mais il n'y a pas ces médicaments-là. Donc, c'est quand ils repartaient, ils ne revenaient plus. Ensuite, au niveau de la prise en charge, il n'y avait pas une fiche de traitement des, des enfants mis sous traitement préventif, ce qui, est, ce qui posait alors les problèmes pour les ici euh, à la fin des traitements préventifs pour ces enfants, pour savoir qui ont terminé les traitements et qui ont interrompu les traitements. Cela nous a poussé à mettre en œuvre quelques activités pour essayer d'adresser ces problèmes. Slide, next slide, please. Next slide. Donc, les activités mises en place, c'était un, sensibilisation des parents lors des visites d'investigation des sujets contacts, donc les persuader à comprendre l'importance des traitements des préventifs de leurs enfants qui ont moins de 5 ans, et mais de les assurer aussi cet accompagnement communautaire pour une facilité à l'accès à ces traitements préventifs au niveau des structures de prise en charge. Nous avons donc planifié le plaidoyer auprès des responsables des institutions de soins de la tuberculose pédiatrique pour la suppression des freins de consultation qui constituait une vraie barrière pour les parents qui venaient avec volonté après, euh, après cette sensibilisation, mais qui étaient bités à cet obstacle. Mais aussi, nous avons euh, mené un plaidoyer au niveau du programme national de lutte contre la tuberculose pour assurer euh, un approvisionnement continu euh, sans interruption des médicaments en tuberculose pédiatrique, mais aussi approvisionner les structures de prise en charge en fiche de traitement préventif pour assurer un, un, un bon traitement préventif aux enfants qui étaient mis sous traitement. À la fin, nous avons organisé la consultation multipartite euh, avec tous les partenaires, comme j'ai dit, et il y a eu une déclaration euh, d'engagement qui a été donc signée euh, avec les programmes nationaux de lutte contre la tuberculose, les, les responsables des structures euh, de plus en charge, c'était beaucoup plus des structures catholiques, protestantes et armées d'Isali qui euh, possèdent 60 des structures de prise en charge de la tuberculose ici à Kinshasa et aussi euh, euh, d'autres partenaires qui appuient la lutte contre la tuberculose en RDC, en RDC dont les fonds mondiaux, Cordet, des saint rue Action d'Amiens et autres. Et au final, pour terminer, next slide please, last one. Donc, euh, le dialogue avec les programmes nationaux donc, a permis la mise en disponibilité des cartes de traitement de la tuberculose euh, préventive dans les centres de santé. Donc, maintenant, c'est disponible. Le dialogue avec les responsables des structures a permis euh, qu'il y ait une note circulaire sur la suppression des frais de consultation pour les enfants contacts orientés par les membres de la communauté et donc qui devaient accéder aux soins préventifs sans frais de consultation. Ça a été supprimé. Ça aussi est un résultat super de notre plaidoyer. Et enfin, il y a eu cette, la signature de la déclaration euh, à l'issue de la consultation multipartite de, 
programme tuberculose, partenaire de lutte contre la tuberculose et les responsables de structures de prise en charge pour la réduction des obstacles à l'accès aux services de la tuberculose à Kinshasa. Donc, vous avez là à droite la photo qui montre cette note circulaire. Et au début de ma présentation, il y avait la déclaration signée. Et donc, nous pouvons dire aujourd'hui que c'est bon avec l'accès aux soins préventifs des enfants de moins de 5 ans, question de continuer l'élan et de ne pas arrêter même après la clôture du projet CAPTB. Thank you all for your particular attention. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Maxime, pour cet uh, exposé très intéressant. Il y a beaucoup de uh, soutien qui est encore uh, possible pour les, uh, pour les enfants avec la tuberculose. Thank you to all of the speakers today. It's been wonderful having you all bring your perspectives on this, on this uh, incredibly challenging time in terms of dealing with TB, HIV in the midst of COVID. Um, we're opening the floor to anyone who would like to ask any questions of our speakers. Please just raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. Otherwise, you can also send your questions in through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we also invite you to send any um, questions that we don't have time to get to through publications at tedx.org, and we'll be able to respond to your questions before the end of the day is our intention. So we have about two minutes. Um, before we have to close the session. If anybody has any questions, please do raise your hand. I'd also like to just comment that um, we're going to have the opportunity to share more information around um, the findings and the effects of COVID-19 on TB pediatric cascades, especially in Cameroon at the union conference that will be coming up in October. So we'll be able to um, Share, that, share additional data with everyone there, and we hope that we'll um, see most of you attending that, that conference as well. I don't see any hands, so uh, there was a question that was going to be asked um, for Judith. If you have time in just one minute, maybe you can talk about the kinds of innovations and maybe some of the topics that Jackie presented today in the presentation that would really need uh, in country to be able to support COVID testing and TB patients. Since you mentioned that there were uh, quite a few challenges around access to tests, the registers being bulky. If you could just comment very quickly on that before we close the session, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Cassandra. So very quickly around integrating COVID testing in TB. And again, I see this as standing a threat into opportunity, I see two, two, two main things. One is to integrate the algorithm for screening for TB and COVID, perhaps using an electronic method that's easy to transmit the result and linking this integrated screening to integrated dual sample collection with test results. The other point I wanted to link, and I like what Jackie talked about in terms of digital health technologies, is to leverage, to enhance existing platforms to, to deliver results, to, to enable the digital health to, to make us be able to do telemonitoring, have a dashboard to access the data, and also automate data sharing. So a lot of what Jackie talked about would go very well in integrating COVID testing and TB. So again, uh, linking the algorithms and also using the digital health technologies for the screening, results sharing, sharing and telemonitoring as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. And thank you again to all the speakers and all the participants that joined us today. I think we have a lot of food for thought and a lot of work ahead of us. And we really appreciate all the hard effort that's coming in from the countries to support the patients and especially the children fighting TB and HIV. And with that, I think we'll conclude the webinar for today. You can also find our live stream on Facebook if you'd like to share the recording as well further on. Thank you, everyone.